this whole territory of cultivation, you know, in Sanskrit, bhavana, neuro bhavana. I just think that's a phenomenal opportunity. You can't do anything about the past, but yes. you can learn as much as possible from the yes. next minute. You know, what shall you do? Mm. So beautiful. Yeah. So, so there are several things that come to mind to ask you about. Um, the first is just to, to touch on and, and going back a little bit. When you, when you talked about the brain as the black box, yeah. I, I really like that, that metaphor because one of the ways that I talk about it sometimes in terms of thinking about mind-body dualism and, and the process of, of how we think about connecting conscious experience to neurobiology is that in a way we, we're in this predicament where the brain doesn't know that it's a brain. We, we, in, in a way it's, it's hermetically sealed. We have, we have this chamber in which we're experiencing everything and then we have this whole other area that for probably for evolutionary terms it, it was not advantageous to be aware of everything that's going on behind the curtain. Right? And so, so this is what I find so, so fascinating philosophically about the intersection of these disciplines. And in terms of the, the evolutionary process and the ways in which our brains have uh, adapted and perhaps maladapted in some ways, or there, there's a little bit of a mixed bag there, I think it gets into exactly what you're talking about that, that I find also really um, powerful and effective about your work which is the, the recognition that we have a negativity bias, the recognition that part of how we evolve is that we overemphasize uh, negative experiences. The, the phrase that I, and I don't know if you coined this phrase, if you did, it's, it's brilliant, which is that the, the brain is, uh, is Velcro for bad experiences and Teflon for good experiences, right? Yeah, that one's mine. Yeah, fantastic. So, so, so useful. I, I use it in my classes all the time. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that, about both the, the negativity bias, and then this idea of yours of taking in the good, which I know has roots in, in lots of different sources. Oh, thank you. Um, well, let's see. So, the, in an evolutionary frame, our ancestors needed to both get carrots and avoid sticks, right? They needed to get the carrots of food and so forth and avoid the sticks of predators, etc. Okay, both are important, but now imagine life as a uh, monkey or a squirrel or crab or jellyfish. 600 million years ago, the advent of the nervous system first began to evolve. You know, you need to get food. You need to mate. You know, you need to pursue carrots. But if you don't get a carrot today, you'll have a chance of one tomorrow. But if you fail to avoid that predator today uh, uh, or that hazard or that risk uh, today, uh, you, you may never have a chance to see the sunrise and you may never have a chance at another carrot. So High we six. have a brain that's evolved to do kind of like six five things <laughs> which have a sixth consequence first we're continually scanning for bad news you can just watch it in your mind today everything's fine and you're still looking for a problem uh, two when we locate a negative stimulus uh, we over focus upon it so in the total mosaic of reality or the mosaic of our own phenomenology our own experience um, the one tile that's blinking red we lock perception down upon it and we lose we lose sight of the whole very often. We're designed to do that because you've got to deal with that immediate you know, situation. And then third, we overreact to it. The brain reacts more intensely to negative stimuli than to positive stimuli. Fourth, we fast track it into emotional memory. Once burned, twice shy. So there's a lot of evidence for the ways in which people remember bad, negative information about another person more than positive information, thus attack ads in politics. Uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, people are very vulnerable to acquiring a sense of what's called learned helplessness from just a few experiences of futility and pain and defeat. Uh, we're very affected by negative interactions in a relationship. It takes many more positive interactions to sort of balance the impact of a negative interaction. Um, fifth impact is that the brain then gets sensitized to the negative through those negative experiences. So we react even more intensely down the road. Because that's how you keep critters alive in the harsh conditions. That's the brain. That's hard science, full science. That's the way it is. You know, mm -hmm. there are some offsets by the fact that people tend to edit pain out of personal recollections, but the emotional residues mm -hmm. remain. 
And also there's a little bit of an offset. People tend to have lots of quantity effect for positive experiences, lots of little mildly pleasant moments in the lives of most people with many unfortunate exceptions, obviously. So you get a quantity effect for positive experiences, but you get a quality effect for negative ones. And then that tends to create negative cycles. That's the sixth impact uh, out in the world. You know, you go negative in your relationship, they get negative, it confirms your view. I knew they were an asshole all along, round and round it goes. And you can scale that up to conflicts between um, in in family systems, in organizations, and in countries, and yeah. green countries in the world altogether. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the truth of things. And so for me, the takeaway is, okay, occasionally the negativity bias is useful. Mm-hmm. We never want to fight the negative because then you just go more negative. We need to deal with the negative. But Mother Nature is tilted toward overlearning from negative experiences. So if we tilt toward positive ones, we just level the playing field. Mm-hmm. And that's a really important uh, idea for people, I think, to get. You're not uh, looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. Yeah. Yeah. I don't believe in positive thinking. I believe in realistic thinking with a brain that's designed to overfocus on the negative and trick us routinely. Mm-hmm. It's Mother Nature's well intended delusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, to feel anxious when you don't need to feel anxious, to feel driven when you already have plenty, and to feel lonely and resentful even though you're resting in a very powerful network of mm-hmm. love flowing in and love flowing out. Mm-hmm. Not always. I'm not trying to deny anything problematic. Absolutely. Actually, the more a person's life sucks, the more important it is to take in the good, mm-hmm. to look for those opportunities for beneficial experiences yes. from inside or from outside to grow psychological muscles mm-hmm. as you know, embedded in the hardware of your own brain to deal with the negative mm-hmm. things. To become more resilient. Yeah. Plus, if you're interested, I mean, the, my deep interest uh, is around spiritual practice. Uh-huh. And if you buy the Buddha's drive theory of suffering, uh, you know, it's purely psychological. There is suffering. You know, drives cause suffering, undoing drives, undoing the craving associated with drives in suffering, uh, you know, or minimizes it, even ends it, and then there's a path for doing that that's very psychologically defined. Mm-hmm. What causes craving? Craving in the second noble truth that causes suffering is the result of an internal sense of deficit or disturbance. And um, it's not just based on your conditions. There are a lot of people who are craving a lot in Beverly Hills. You know, they have a lot of material circumstances, but they have a hungry heart. There are a lot of people who live in, you know, poverty uh, in parts of the world that are not, you know, disturbed inside themselves. They have a deep inner peace. So one of the fruits of repeatedly cultivating and internalizing beneficial experiences of your core needs met, which for me is safety, satisfaction, connection, linked to the inner lizard, mouse, and monkey we all have, brain stem, subcortex, cortex, <laughs> safety, satisfaction, connection. As you internalize those experiences, you know, more and more you approach life from a sense of fullness and balance rather than deficit and disturbance. That's mm-hmm. kind of a neuropsychological way in an evolutionary frame of operationalizing the transition from the second to the third noble truths. Mm -hmm. But as you do that in the trenches of your own everyday life, you can feel from the inside out that there's less and less basis for craving. Mm -hmm. There might be some delusional craving, there might be some auto craving, but there's no actual basis inside yourself in that moment in deficit or disturbance. And that is a very beautiful powerful practice Mm -hmm. that can help people step out of what I call the red zone brain, which is, you know, the brain and the second noble truth Mm -hmm. and help yourself over time, very authentically from the inside out, lots of little jewels gradually woven into the fabric of your own nervous system and therefore your life. So you can live more from a green zone brain, which is a modern way of talking about, you know, approaching life from the third noble truth in Mm -hmm. Buddhism. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot.